with number six, you have Aldemet labeled below 400 milligrams TID, how many milliliters we give per dose. All you're going to do is take the milligrams 400 and divide it by the 250 times five. Okay, nothing to do with the TID. Nope, because TID would be, that's just how many doses you would give per day. And okay. we only care about what we're giving per dose. Oh, okay, thank you. You're welcome. And um, and I figured that was what your question was because I've been getting yes, that a lot with all yeah. the semesters. So yeah. if they want to know per day, it'll say per day. Oh, okay. If it says nothing or it says per dose, they want per dose. Oh, okay, thank you. Okay, so that applies to number nine as well. The one that says QID, even though it says yeah. per dose. Yep, QID is just how you would see it on the order, okay. okay? So like, yeah, they need to take that dose four times, but you don't need to, um, you don't need to do, uh, you don't need to calculate. Think about it this way. So like with this one, the mycostatin, it's an oral swish. Are you gonna um, put the entire day's worth of oral swish and then yeah. expect that they're going to divide that out equally in fourths? Mm -hmm. So, right, so don't make it any more complicated uh, you know, than that. And you're asking the right question because, you know, yeah, you want to account for the fact, okay, I'm going to be giving this to this person four times a day, but we just want to know how much you're going to get per dose. Okay. Good question. Please. Sir, please just, uh, sorry. Go ahead. I was going to talk about the 13, about the weight over there. That's kind of confusing for me. I asked of the 13. Sure. Yeah, so with 13, um, the patient's weight has no variant on the equation. It's just extra information. So I could also tell you he's got red shirt, wears glasses, and prefers mm -hmm. long walks on the beach with his dog poodles. It doesn't, all that's just extra information. All you need to do is take the five milligrams ordered and divide it by um, the four milligrams times one. Can I please ask a follow-up question? So in what case would you have to use the, the weight over there? In what situation? That's a good question. So let's say that this said dextamethasone sodium phosphate, five milligrams per kilogram. Mm -hmm. If it says per kilogram, then you have to account for the patient's body weight. Oh, thank you. You're welcome. So you, you saw a question like that last semester in the second semester test so mm -hmm. if you if you go to um the link um click on the link and download the uh or, or review your last semester practice test it's the same practice test you'll see the example where they they have a patient weight uh the patient weighs 176 pounds um it's for dilantin and it's 15 milligrams per kilogram body weight um so sometimes you need the patient's body weight and sometimes you don't and what tells you if you need it or not is the order will usually say milligrams per kilogram okay thank you so much you're welcome and that was a very good question and you guys are going to see that a lot in the um in, when you get to the pediatrics um and then if you want more practice on that if you go to my youtube channel i did um a lot of the pediatric practice questions um and so you'll actually can see um, what these will look like. It'll say like milligram per kilogram body weight or something along those lines. And so that's how you know when to use it and when not to use it. So for the exam purpose, are we going to be seeing something like this for next week or is this just going to be bordered on the milligrams per um, ml? It, it's probably going to look mostly like this, but like I said, I just told you what that would look like. And if you need a practice question, just look at your third or your second semester test and you'll see a weight-based second semester test. Um, also, the heparin protocol is all weight-based. So we'll, when we go through that, you'll see how to do the weight-based type questions too. Please, can you refresh whenever you attend to orders? Number five, I know you did it last semester, just for a refresh mm -hmm. on it. Are you saying question number five? Yeah, when oh. you get to other people's question, they can do that last. I just bumped into it just for a refresh purpose, please. Okay, you remind me, because I'm going to go 16, 
and then I'll come back to five and then okay. I'll um and then I'll talk about this. Now I'm I'm going over this like briefly, um, just because I know you guys know how to do this stuff. I think you just need like a refresher of how to mm -hmm. set it up. But mm -hmm. if I say something and you're like, no, 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 show me, just stop me and I'll show you. Okay. That's why I have the that's why I got the marker in my hand. <laughs> <laughs> but I know that. So this one I'm gonna show you just because this is the one that gives everyone trouble is the flow rate questions. Um so let me get a blank piece of paper. So first of all, before I answer this question, when we calculate flow rates, flow rate, oh, I'm sorry, we calculate drop rate. I need two pieces of information. I need the flow rate and I need the drop factor. Those two pieces of information will help me get to my drop rate, which is always gonna be written as drops per minute. Okay, so that's GTT per minute, not GH. When I come and look at my um, sample question, it says the tubing is labeled shown below. So you can see the drop factors listed here as 15, 15 mm -hmm. drops per ml. That will always be given to you. Um, so you'll know what that is. Then it says we're to administer an IV solution at a rate of 75 milliliters in 25 minutes. So there's your flow rate. So 75 milliliters. 25 minutes times my drop factor, which was 15. You know you've set it up right because you can eliminate those if you're doing dimensional analysis. If you're trying to do ordered over have for flow rate questions, you're going to have a hard time with it. It can be done, but you're going to have a hard time with it. I'm just letting you know that right, at, right now. Um, and then when you do 75 times 15 divided by 25, divided by 25, you'll get 45 drops per minute. Hey, Dr. Rat. Yes. You could just do 75 times 15 divided by 25 and just be done with it. Correct. That's all I did, yeah. But you don't need a, you don't necessarily need to do the dimensional analysis. No, but I mean, you are doing dimensional analysis. You just you're just doing it like I'll just answer. This is Chris, right? Yes, sir. I recognize your voice. Uh, <laughs> so when um, when I do this, I do exactly what you just said. I just do. Actually, I don't even I, I reduce this first. So I just say three times 15. I don't write anything down when I actually solve these like personally okay. the reason i show this to you is just so like let's say you get stuck and you start getting numbers that are not drops per minute or i mean it's not 45 you're getting some other answer this will just help you to be organized just in case it's something different so but what you said was 100 percent correct okay thank you you're welcome all right um the only variation you're going to see on flow rate is sometimes it'll be milliliters per hour and then all you got to do is remember to convert hours to minutes and um, and then you'll be fine. And you can do exactly what Chris said. Just take the top or just do, um, you know, 75 times 15 times whatever the minute or divided by whatever the minutes are. And then you'll be good to go. All right. Before I do 22 and 23, let me jump back to five. You're actually the first person to ask about the urine uh, input output question. Well, no urine input, but urine output question. Um, yeah, I know you did that last semester. Just to refresh again. Absolutely. So for the um, when we talk about urine output, we're just talking about replacement volumes. Mm -hmm. um, so I, um, you, you can do this any number of ways. Um, the way that I uh, have been showing people how to do this is um, I take uh, I take the actual output. So I take the actual output. So they actually they actually voided out 500 milliliters, and I put that over the expected output. So the expected output is what they tell you in the beginning. You know, for every 125 milliliters of urine output then we're going to replace. Then I just multiply by the replacement volume. So that's that 40. So notice how everything's in milliliters. So like me telling you that, you know, to do dimensional analysis, 
just makes things extra complicated. But just remember that you're always multiplying by the replacement volume. You always put your actual void out. So the actual void is, it tells you if your output was 500 milliliters over the last 400 hours. And then you just set this up like this. So like I said, actual over expected or initial or however you want to look at that. And then I think you get 160 milliliters is the replacement volume. So if, if you set this up the same way, and the way I ask this question, it's going to be set up exactly the same way. I don't really vary from it. Um, so you would just put this last volume over the first volume times the replacement volume. All right. Now, 22 and 23 is actually a good warm up for um, what you're going to be doing with the uh, um, heparin protocol. All right, so 22 says you have 0.45% normal saline, 1000 milliliters IV, and it contains heparin 25,000 units. It's infusing at 1,000 units per hour. What is the flow rate? So I, um, I'm going to tell you to start this problem. Start with your given flow rate, which is the 1,000 units per hour. And we don't want units. We want milliliters per hour, right? So do I have a way to go from milliliters to units? And the answer is yes. The IV bag tells me how to do that. So I have 1,000 milliliters. 25,000 units. And then I know I've set this up right because I can eliminate units and I'll be left with milliliters per hour. So if you did 1,000 divided by 25,000 times 1,000, then you, you're setting that up right. These questions, you could easily throw the numbers into the wrong places. Mm -hmm. So sometimes this is just for an organizational standpoint, this is very helpful. Okay. Um, and then when you do this, 1,000 times 1,000 divided by 25,000, you get 40 milliliters per hour. So that's 22. 23 is going to be the exact same methodology as far as trying to answer the question. Except you're just instead of dealing with um, heparin, now we're dealing with insulin. Notice that I don't tell you anything about the 0.9%, 0.45%. That's just, I think 0.9%, correct me if I'm wrong, is that normal saline? And that's, and 0.45 is half normal saline? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's just the medium in which it's in, right? So yeah. that that's why you don't really, it doesn't matter. That just tells you what it what what it's in. Um, so again, I'm going to start off with, they tell me 500 milliliters IV that has 500 units of insulin and it's infusing at 10 units per hour. So I'm going to do the same thing, 10 units per hour. Do I have a way to get from units per hour to milliliters per, per hour? And the answer Can you raise it up some more? We can't see. Yeah, I'm going to move it up. Um, it's okay. coming up, I promise. <laughs> I, I can see what I, you can see too. So thank you. <laughs> so can I convert? Is there a way to go from units uh, per hour to milliliters per hour? And the answer is, yeah, we just look at the IV. So the IV says there's 500 units in 500 milliliters. And then I made this one really easy for you. You can just cross those out. And your answer is also 10 ml per hour. 10 ml per hour. Okay. So these are good to practice the uh, 22 and 23 because you're going to actually do it two more times in the heparin protocol, which is what we're going to get into next. So, Dr. Rad. Yes, sir. But you, you could also do that the same as the one before. You could take a thousand units, divide about 25,000 units, and then times it by a thousand ml and still get the same answer. For this one, yes. Yes. And for the bottom one, you could do 10 units divided by 500 units times 500 and get 10 ml. You got it. Yes. Yeah. Okay. You're instinctively what you're doing is correct. So um, as long as you're doing it that way every time and you're getting the right answer every time, then you're doing it right. Okay. Thank you. 
you're welcome. Yeah, I don't want to ever say anything to discourage how you're setting it up because there's more than one way to do it right. So you're doing that right. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. So I blew up the heparin protocol. So that way you we all can see it a little bit uh, cleaner, um, a little bit bigger. Can you do 24 when you get a chance? Yes. The short answer on 24 is once you calculate the time, because I think most people are getting to that, then you just need to um, add that many or add that many hours. So uh, did every did you get 20 hours is your answer when you calculated out the flow rate? Yeah. Okay. So the next thing is, um, you know, it started Monday at 8 a.m. Right. So, so that's what would be 4 a.m. Right. Because I was between 3 to 4 a.m. I wasn't sure. So uh, here's the shortcut. So like for Monday at 8 a.m., what time will it be 24 hours later? 8 a.m. 8 a.m. What day? The next day, Tuesday. Tuesday. Right. So so 24 hours later, it'll be 8 a.m. on Tuesday. So just subtract four hours. Okay. Uh, and I think you said 4 a.m. on Tuesday. Mm -hmm. Yep. That's all that it is. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, so this is the heparin protocol. Um, I'm going to kind of slide it around because I know that it's not all fitting on the screen. So you're going to get this protocol. Now, everything that's listed here, and I'll explain all my, my writing on here in just a second. So there's where well, you're seeing all this 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 7, 9, 10, and then 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. Those are all steps to the protocol. Okay. So they're not questions you need to answer. The only questions you need to answer are down here, the A, B, and C, where it's C1 and C2. That's the questions that you're answering um, for the heparin protocol. The heparin protocol is just a standard. So if like you do a Google search for heparin protocol, you will see exactly the same thing I see, which is... Um, um, you would just see these numbers and then, and what they are. So what I did was I first wanted to indicate, and I crossed out, these are things you do not need to worry about with the heparin protocol. You don't need to worry about the CBC, the GAIAX stool, the neuro checks. These are not things that you're being asked to fill in. This is a dosage calc test. You're just asked to do the math. Okay. So um, just for extra information, do you know what those are like? For CBC, how often should we check? I don't know. I have no idea. Yeah, okay. I'm sure. I'm sure if you did a um a search, you could you could find that. And I'm sure it's written in a book, but it also might differ from facility to facility. So um, I don't know the answer to that. Good question. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. So what um what is important in the protocol are actually um steps one steps two, and then steps 10. And I know step 10 is way down here and I'll show you that in a second. So step one, we have to account for the patient's weight in kilograms. So step one is you're gonna take the patient's weight, divide by 2.2, and then, and if you need to round to the nearest 10th and get the patient's weight in kilograms, okay? This is pretty much the only thing that I can change in the um, question and on your test is the patient's weight. Everything else is, like I said, it's a, it's standard. And so I'll show you what I mean by that in a moment. The next important piece of information is found in step two of the heparin protocol, which base, which tells me what I have on hand. What are my available? So my IV is the heparin 25,000 units in the 250 milliliter half normal saline. Okay. So this is actually how I'm going to calculate my flow rate or my drop rate is by using the, I, the information from the IV bag. So this is just like question 22 that we just did a, a few moments ago. Mm -hmm. The bolus dosage strength tells us the bolus dosage strength and it's a thousand units per milliliter. So that'll be important in a moment. Now, when you asked earlier, somebody asked earlier about, well, how do I know when to incorporate a patient's weight? Well, when it tells you to. So it says to bolus with 80 units per kilogram. That per kilogram tells you you have to account for the patient's weight, okay? 
then you're going to start a drip at 18 units per kilogram per hour. So again, that kilogram tells you we have to account for the patient's weight. Okay. Okay. So let's look at the first question. The first question says to calculate the number of milliliters to administer for the bolus. So step one is we're going to get them started with a bolus dose. The protocol, and again, I'm just going back to the protocol, tells me bolus with 80 units per kilogram. So let's start with that information. I need another piece of paper here. Okay, so patient weighs 50 kilograms. So we're doing part A. The patient weighs 50 kilograms. The bolus tells me 80 units per kilogram. 80 times 50 is 4,000. Now, if the question had said, how many units to administer for the bolus, we'd be done. But the question said, how many milliliters? So I need a way to convert units to milliliters. And so I'm gonna go back to the protocol. And what are we talking about here? We're actually talking about the bolus, right? So the bolus dose of strength is what? 1,000 units per milliliter. So that's what I'm gonna use that information is what I'm gonna to use to plug in right here. One milliliter, 1,000 units. When I do that, I get four milliliters is how much I'm going to bolus dose heparin. Now, for the simplistic way of doing this is you're just gonna take the patient's weight which again, that will change depending on the patient's weight, obviously, times 80 over 1,000. That will give you the bolus dosage strength and will answer question A every single time. So I showed you the long way. I'm showing you a shortcut now, okay? And don't worry, I have one for every single one of these. B. B says to calculate the infusion rate in milliliters per hour for the heparin IV drip. So again, we're still talking about the initial protocol, meaning we just got them started with a bolus dose. They're hooked up to the IV. What do I program the IV in milliliters per hour? Okay, so that's that. So again, I'm going to go back to the beginning where it says bolus with 80 units per kilogram. We did that already. Now we're gonna start a drip at 18 units per kilogram per hour. So I'm gonna take that 18 units per kilogram per hour. And again, that's where we're accounting for the patient's weight. So 50 times 18, I get 900 units per hour. That should look familiar, right? Remember we had units per hour in question 22? So how do we get to, or is there a way to get from units per hour to milliliters per hour? Yes. We have a way to get, we can convert units to milliliters. And we do that by going back into the protocol. Step two, 25,000 units in 250 ml. 25,000 units. 250 ml. When I do that, I get 9 ml per hour. Can you hold on for one second, please? Sure. Okay. So, again, there's a shortcut for this. Patient's weight in this instance, and this is scenario, it's 50 times 18 divided by 100. And that will get us to the same answer that we did up here. So all I'm doing is shorthanding 
and giving you these things because this relationship right here, the 250 over 25,000 is the same thing as one over 100. Okay. So I'm just letting you know. So if you like, let's say you wanted to challenge yourself and put in a different patient weight, let's say 220 pounds, round your answer to the nearest 10th, multiply by 80, divide by a thousand. That's how much you would bolus somebody who's 220 pounds. Same thing here. That's just what you would start your IV rate at. If for someone who's 220 pounds, you divide by 2.2, round to the nearest 10th, times 18 divided by 100, and then you'll get your answer. And again, to the nearest 10th. Can you tell me where you got the 100? Yeah, I did 250 divided by 25,000. And okay. that relationship is one over 100. Okay. Yep. Good question. Dr. Wright. Yes, sir. So as long as you know that whatever the weight is in kilograms times 80 divided by 1,000, that will always set up part A. And as long as you know whatever the weight is times 18 divided by 100 will always set up part B. You got it. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, so what I would say is use that. Um, I was having a conversation with some students earlier today, and I said, you know, do it. Do it the long way just to make sure you're setting everything up right and then check your answers using the short way. So like, let's say, let's say you chose a patient's weight and then you wanted me to verify your answer. This is what I'm going to do. I'm going to take the weight that you give me. I'm going to times it by 80, divide by a thousand. And then I'm just going to make sure you got the same thing I got. I'm not going to write all this stuff out, but this helpful to see it. That's why I write it out for you guys. Okay. All right, so C part one says we ran the protocol and we ran it for six hours. After six hours, we take their APTT and we see that it is 43 seconds. So that's where steps 11 through 15 come in. Now you can see that each step in the box is a different variation of what happens with the APTT. Notice that we didn't do an initial APTT. I imagine it was done. Um, because that's how you're evaluating. But think about what you're using and why you would put someone on a heparin protocol. They're at risk of throwing a clot, right? So maybe they're older, maybe they had a, um, you know, maybe they broke their hip and they just got out of surgery and they're going to be sedentary for a while. And so we're concerned about them clotting. And so we want to evaluate and make sure they don't bleed out, right? And so that's why we're assessing the APTT. So it says 43 seconds is the APTT. So I'm just looking for the range that accounts for that. And that's where step 12 comes in. Now, if it was a different time, I would just follow whatever the information says to do in each of these things, okay? So um, here it says 43 seconds. This is my range. It tells me to do two pieces of things. It tells me to re-bolus with 40 units per kilogram and then to increase the rate by two units per kilogram per hour. Now, 40 units per kilogram is what? It's exactly half of the 80 units per kilogram that we started with. So if you gave him four milliliters to start, you're gonna now give him two milliliters as a secondary bolus. But let's work that out so we don't just guess at that. Um, I also wanna say before I move forward, on your, because I always forget with you guys being uh, the third semester, you're only on your test, you're going to have one question. That's this whole heparin protocol. And you're going to have to answer two questions um, in that, in that one question. I gave you four for practice. So I gave you one, two, and then um, three and four. But on your actual test, you're either going to get just A and B or just C1, C2. Okay. So you're not going to have all four of these to answer. You're going to have two to answer. The whole thing counts as one question. So if you miss one and get one right, you miss the question. If you miss them both, you missed one question. And if you get them both right, then obviously you got the question right. All right. I ask you a question, Mr. David. Yes. Uh, I know Raquel was asking you how you arrived at the 100. So you, you divided the 250 by the... 25,000. 25. Okay. That's how you arrive at that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Good question. Okay. So C, C1 tells me to calculate the number of milliliters per prepare for 
the bolus, the new bolus. Okay, so it says in here the protocol says to do the updated protocol tells me to do 40 units per kilogram. So I'm going to follow the same protocol steps, same patient. This time, instead of 80 units, it's 40 units per kilogram. That gives me 2,000 units. Since we're talking about bolus, I'm going to use the same bolus information that I used before because that's the only thing I have available that's considered bolus. And that was the one milliliter, 1,000 units. And that's how I get two milliliters. And so I gave you two ways to answer that question. So the 40 units per kilogram is exactly half of the 80 units per kilogram. So half of four is two. That's a perfectly fine thing to do as long as we're talking about the same patient with the same weight. If we're talking about two different patients and obviously that's not gonna work out. The shorthand for this, patient's weight again can vary times 40 over a thousand. You're starting, if, you, if you're not seeing this yet, I'll just point it out to you. Every time you do a bolus dosage strength, you're dividing by a thousand. Every time you're doing a flow rate in the heparin protocol, you're dividing by 100. Bolus is 1,000 unit flow rate. Okay. All right, C, C part two, this is where you gets a little tricky sometimes. It says to calculate the new infusion rate in milliliters per hour. It tells me to increase the rate by two units per kilogram per hour, okay? So I need to go back to the original um, protocol and it told me to start the drip at 18 units per kilogram per hour. So if I'm increasing by two, I don't want to do 18 units per kilogram per hour. I want to do 20 units per kilogram per hour. So all I'm doing is adding two to 18. And so what I'm going to do then is instead of 18 units per kilogram per hour, now it's 20 units per kilogram hour. That gives me 1,000 units per hour. That looks familiar, right? Because that was, again, question 22. I don't want units per hour. I want milliliters per hour. So what I'm going to do is convert the units into milliliters, and I'm going to use the same IV bag in step two of the heparin protocol. And step two said that you had 25,000 units of heparin in 250 ml. And then I also told you that that ratio or that relationship is one over 100. Oh, sorry, I almost wrote one over 100, which would be correct, okay? But that equals 10 milliliters per hour. So I want to tell you guys, the first time I ever did this protocol when I was trying to figure it out so I can share and explain how, how to solve it so you guys know how to do it for your test, I initially wrote 11 milliliters per hour because I took that 9 milliliters per hour and I added 2. So if you did that, I just want you to know you're not alone. But remember, where is the 2 being added? If it was just increased by 2 milliliters per hour, then great. That's what we would do. But because of heparin, they have to account for the patient's mass or their, or their weight. And so we had to add from the 18 units per hour, we had to add two to get to 20 units per hour. As an aside, and not for this particular question, let's say, let's say they had an APTT of you know, 80 seconds, okay? Then you would go to step 14 and it tells you to decrease the rate by two units per kilogram per hour. So the initial rate was 18, then you would drop it down to 16, okay? For this here, 
if the APTT is 90 seconds, then you're going to stop the heparin for an hour and then decrease the rate by three units per kilogram per hour. So the original was 18. You're going to drop it down to 15. 15. Yeah, you got it. Good. And then I imagine that they are with the heparin protocol, they're probably doing this every six hours. And so depending on what the current rate is, that's what you're going to be changing based off of the information that's coming from here. But we don't need to get into that and I'm and no one's gonna ask, or at least I'm not gonna ask you that. Um, so you don't need to worry about that too much, okay? So I will tell you that on your test, it's gonna be num uh, step 12 because you have to do two different things. So like I wouldn't have you, I, you know, I guess I could ask this isolated. And so notice here, 80 units per kilogram. So they would just be a complete rebolus doing exactly what you did in the initial. And then here it says to increase the rate by four units per kilogram per hour. So if it was initially 18, now you're going to bring it up to 22. 22. You got it. Yep. You got it. And then the short, the short way to solve um, the second part is you take the patient's weight in kilograms. Again, that can change. That's why I'm putting these dots around the number. Just that's the thing that changes times 20. And then because we're doing flow rate, you know, it's going to be divided by 100. Dr. Rat. Yes. When you're, when you're giving the test, would you give like a question A and like C1, or would you give C1 and C2 together and then like A and B together? Good question. Yeah, I would give A and B together or C1 and C2 together. I'm not going to give you two boluses. And I think, you know, your instructors want you to do a bolus and uh, a flow rate with this. Okay, so it'd be structured like C1 and C2, or it'd be A and B. Yes. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Dr. Rod. Yes. Uh, I need help over here with question 17. Mm-hmm. Can you please explain why we don't utilize the 200 mg in the calculation? Good. That's actually a really good um, question. So, um, I'm gonna I'm gonna start off with um, just uh, an analogy first, just to kind of help to, and then I'll, I'll explain this a little bit in better detail. So okay. let's say let's say you and I are both gonna drive to Kennywood. I'm going to take my Porsche 911 and you're going to take your Honda Civic. We're both going to drive 45 miles per hour. Are we both going to get there about the same time? And the answer to that would be, yeah, we're both going to get there because we're both traveling the same rate of speed. doesn't matter that I'm in a sports car and you're in a, um, a car that's probably a little bit better to be driving to Kennywood uh, with the Honda Civic you're going to, it doesn't matter. And, and what I say that is when we're talk when we talk about flow rates or drop rates, all I care about is the speed. I don't care about what's in the bag. Okay. So the solumedrol, the 200 milligrams, that just tells you the strength of what's in the IV. Okay. Okay. So when, when, remember um, earlier, I said, when you calculate flow rate or when you're calculating drop rate, you only need two, two pieces of information. You need the flow rate and you need the drop factor. So milligrams doesn't come into account at all for that, okay? So that's why you ignore it. It's just extra information. It's like that patient weight in that one problem where you didn't need to account for the patient's weight. It's just telling you that it's a 200 milligram IV. Oh, okay. Okay. And then you would just take the 75 mil over the 30 minutes and then multiply by the drop factor of 10. And that will give you your answer. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. And that's a very good question because that's a common thing that people uh, or that students have a hard time with is what do I do with Why is there other numbers? How do I incorporate it and get my answer? And that's also the trick is they want you, you know, well, we want you at the college to be able to discern between the information that's important and the information that's not important. That's why I give you these stupid analogies about driving cars to Kennywood. So. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. 